Partnerships and relationships are hard. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and um, pay my respects to the elders tonight. Um, thank you for organising this. I think it's a really um, timely gesture, if you like, considering what's happening internationally um, around anti-immigrant politics in Norway and anti-refugee politics or anti-asylum seeker politics in Australia with the Malaysia deal where we're now swapping refugees as if they some commodities. So I um, thank the organisers for this opportunity, at least to dialogue um, some of the things that don't often get talked about in the public space. So I'm probably just going to touch on the field of practice that I guess what we're really talking about here. Um, sometimes we call it arts and social justice. Sometimes we call it community arts. I'm much more specific in the way I see this field of work. Um, community cultural development is the term I use and it's the field I work in and it's the practice, the critical practice that I, at every opportunity, as some people in the audience will know, I will advocate for. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what that practice is in terms of how artists can engage in that practice and how community workers or community activists, <coughs> social activists, indeed can engage in community cultural development. Um, to start with, community cultural development I'm going to call it CCD from here on in because that's our field term, CCD. CCD describes the work undertaken between communities and artists um, and cultural workers to express community and group experiences, concerns, issues, um, aspirations and identity through art and cultural production. CCD is quite different from community art in that community cultural development insists on a process that privileges the community as creator and producer. This process is especially crucial in building individual mastery and community capacities with the aim of affecting transformation. And this is very important tonight. CCD is at once participatory and empowering. In this way, CCD is a strength-based approach to working with communities in general, but most especially, and in my case, and in the case of all our speakers, with marginalised and socially excluded groups. It is the work with the excluded and the invisible where CCD is at its most productive and effective, precisely because the very principles of CCD provide a framework that centres diversity in all its manifestations, whether it's cultural or social. Active participation, particularly for young people, for minorities and for minorities within minorities. Um, equality and self or group expression and creativity. These are incredibly important um, key words in CCD practice. Within this framework, access to resources and safe spaces to speak and create are critical components of how CCD is affected in enabling communities who are least heard or whose experiences of dislocation, trauma and loss remain with them into the present. In this way, CCD is a critical tool for developing the capacities of refugees and in my work, I have um, worked with migrant and refugee communities for close to 25 years now, um, mostly in Western Sydney, and I have moved, in the last 10 years I've worked a lot with small and emerging African communities, but over a period I think I've worked with nearly every community in, in Sydney. And um, I've actually worked in London for a little while at the British Refugee Council, so I suppose the sum total of all my experience is 
really a human and basic experience. Um, I'm also a writer and I bring, I guess, I, I don't privilege my, my artistic sensibilities over my community sensibilities. What CCD really is about is a, a bringing together and seeking equal partnerships of art and community development principles. And that's what makes CCD quite a unique practice and skill. Um, a feature of emerging refugee communities is the lack of both cultural and economic infrastructures, two critical foundations that communities identify as crucial to their development and to interest communal cohesion. CCD aims to stimulate and facilitate the flow of resources and information through the mentoring and training up of community members to deploy culture as a tool for education, <coughs> socialisation, particularly when you think of, um, say for example, to these refugees, young people who were born into refugee camps and have spent their formative years and been socialised in refugee camps, then coming into a space like Sydney and trying to navigate and negotiate systems that are completely alien <coughs> and end up, you know, day to night being the demonised other. So, you know, that's the sort of dentist we work in. Um, and ultimately, um, the training up um, of community members, or the engaging of community members at least, in, in empowering processes. In this way, CCD provides a way for refugee groups, and in, in particular, I think, for young people and women, um, to self-define, self-express, and self-determine the most effective approaches to developing their capacities um, within their own communities. Now this is crucial because I'm um, touching on something um, I think Claudia mentioned, who, who's telling the story? And I think what's important about tonight is who is a question I always ask and how I come to this practice and how I come to this work. For me a really critical question is who's telling the story, who is speaking? And really, the work all of us are doing is empowering refugees to speak for themselves in safe and empowering ways. And for me, that's, that's the most transformative and empowering process that refugees speak for themselves and that others don't. I mean, I think that's really important because representation is an important aspect around ethical practice. If we're going to work ethically with communities, allowing people to speak for themselves in their own languages, on their own terms, is critical to good what I would call good practice. So cultural work, and this is in a sense broader cultural, social activism, cultural work then becomes a tool for social change, a tool that is not being imposed from the outside, but rather a familiar and culturally appropriate mechanism that deploy strategies that are concerned with participation, with speaking, with creativity. So uh, for me, a CCD project um, is shaped to reflect the needs, um, the social past needs, that language or cultural needs, social needs as a bit of the group in general, but it's flexible enough in its approach and application to accommodate the very specific and diverse needs of individuals within groups. So, because I think really to know about storytelling, I'm going to move now into storytelling because that's been an area of my practice um, and how I have worked with refugee groups. And I come, I guess, I've mentioned some of it around the process of empowerment. So I love what you both said about you couldn't speak until you did your story. This, this is when you said that. You know, you can read all the theory in the world, but that really is what it's all about. It's an empowering process to tell your story. And I think storytelling is critical in how we change. I guess bigoted, racist, sexist, homophobic elements within society, but more broadly, how we open up people's, I guess, heart and ears, because listening is the first, uh, is part of this. How do we get people to listen? And I have found myself in later years in reflecting on a lot of the work I have done and I've we've published a lot of books 
we've done films, we've done music projects, we've done performance, we've done probably all art forms. And after years and years of producing and seeing community members empower and go on to produce and make their own work within their community, and then see, you know, backlashes and political discourses that come from mainstream politics, that come from, you know, small squares and suburbs that come through the media. And, you know, sometimes ultimately you wonder, does anyone listen? Why are we back here? You know, 20 years ago when I was working in the community sector, it was really anti-immigrant politics. There was anti-Asian, you could see around Sydney, Asians out, you know, all this anti-Asian stuff. We seem to have these patterns of someone has to be the dean and, and I remember during the September 11th time I was working with a group of Afghan women on a storytelling project and they were coming to the storytelling workshop and talking about how they were having their hijab pulled off and being spat at and there was one awful story of a woman sitting in an ice cream place in Bankstown and this man grabbed her by his hijab and dragged her across the road and ended up here that was back in the years and I remember thinking how do we get people to listen and, and engage? And of course, storytelling has always been one of our core aims. But I always think CPD isn't just about that process. Of it. I think empowerment is a really important part, individual empowerment. But if you're working, as a, for me, as a cultural worker, as a political activist, I see myself as that as well. If you're working at that level, it can't just be about personal empowerment. I think the personal stories have to link in some way to collective experiences which have the capacity to challenge dominant ideologies, the master narratives that go around the media, like, you know, if I hear stop the votes one more time. So the act, I guess, of listening for me is really important. How do we get people to listen? Because that's the first step towards understanding. And the act of listening to people's stories respectfully, giving one full attention, I think in itself is an act of personal empowerment. But to bring about change for social justice, for me especially, this process needs to be collective and needs to be located within one structure. So it's no good us just making work with communities despite the social benefits and outcomes that we claim we see all the time. But for me, there's another level of work that it's important to get those stories to as wide an audience as possible. Because it's only in that engaging with broader audiences that a dialogue in some ways can happen. And thankfully, for you think, digital media and the democratisation of media through digital technologies. This is a great new thing for us. We are able to be producers and disseminate in, you know, going across the Murdoch Empire. We don't, you know, I must say I had a lot of charity for it this week with Murdoch, but it's fabulous that digital media provides us with the opportunity to promote counter discourses, if you like, other stories other voices without having to negotiate all the time with the gatekeepers. You don't particularly maybe want to hear that story because it conflicts with the mainstream master narrative about this is what Muslims are, or this is what Aboriginal people are, or this is what single mothers are, or this is what refugees and asylum seekers are. So the digital storytelling is key, I think, and has triggered, in my view, a rebirth in storytelling. And it sort of mimics the political activism of the late 60s, the movement from civil rights and anti-Vietnam War, where storytelling was very important. And there's a history of storytelling in social activism, um, where storytelling captures, I guess, the understanding of diversity and difference. And storytelling is in these ways, I think, can be a democratic force for at least embodying some change. I would like to see a much more radical change, obviously, but I think CCD provides us with a practice that is ethical 
So it gives refugees a, 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 an opportunity to tell their own stories rather than us speaking on behalf of. And I think it's a long process. I don't see anything changing because as I said, you know, there's a new demon every week and it's, it's refugees and asylum seekers at the minute. You know, I work with the Sudanese community a lot and you know, if you if you monitor the media, there there's a slow burn. You know, the Africans are coming type moral panic happening, and you know, it, within the media narrative, people are fearful. So the hate infested and fear that we have seen um, manifest itself in Norway in an unfortunate way. Um, I think it's important to look. At, at the global context and see what we can do at the local context and I think work collectively to affect some sort of change. That's, I'll finish there, that's where I'll come from at least. Thank you.